Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. I pray that you've had a great week. Looking forward to what the Lord has for each and every one of us as we gather this morning. Uh, everybody, you look great. Uh, for those of you that have been up for a couple of hours, I hope you had a great sunrise and probably on your second cup of coffee. For those of you just pulling yourself out of bed, you look fantastic as well. So let's grab our Bibles, let's grab a pen, let's grab a notebook, uh, uh, and let's get ready to hear from the Lord this morning. Final Sunday of April, and much like March, uh, this April has been unlike any we have ever experienced. Just want to encourage everyone uh, to continue to do what the Lord said was the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Let's keep our eyes on Him. Let's keep uh, our relationship entrenched in Him and keep growing in Him. The world wants to distract us. The world wants to grip us with fear, wants to grip us with impatience, wants to grip us with arrogance, ignorance, pride. Let's not let it happen. Let's be gripped with the Lord. Let's, be, let's let the fruit of the Spirit be flowing from us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. May that be what the, the world sees in us when they look in on our lives. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to be in the book of Jonah, chapter 4. And so, if you have a Bible, please open up to that. And we're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God. And before we jump in uh, to Jonah, chapter 4, just a, a brief reminder. Jonah, chapter 1, it starts off with, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. And the Lord gives them a word, go to Nineveh. I want you to go to that great city and I want you to cry against it for their wickedness has come up against me. Well, Jonah gets that call from the Lord. He gets that word from God. And, you know, I'm sure many of us are sitting at home today. I just want to hear from God. I want to know what his will is for my life, what his plan is for my life. And be like, I'm ready to go. Well, that wasn't Jonah's heart. He gets the word and he says, I'm going to go the other way. And so... He heads to Tarshish, he gets on a boat, pays fare. In fact, he pays to run from the call of the Lord. And while on the boat, a great storm arises. Uh, the, the, the other men on the ship discover, hey, he's running from the Lord. They throw him overboard. And at the end of chapter one, we're told that Jonah is swallowed by a great fish. And not just a great fish, a fish that was appointed by the Lord. And this fish was sent to get Jonah's attention. Jonah chapter two, uh, one of the, the, the great chapters in the Bible where Jonah is just praying and crying out to the Lord. And in verse nine of chapter two, he says this, salvation is from the Lord. The Lord has his attention for sure. And so at that point, the Lord brings him back, has the fish vomit him back out onto the land. And chapter three, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And, and just real quick, that should be an encouragement to you and I. You know, we, uh, so many of the, the stories that we go through in the Bible and that we read about, you know, God is working with imperfect vessels. He, he's working with us. And sometimes um, some of us just need uh, a, a, a little more patience. The Lord needs to knock on our heart a few more times than others. And Jonah's is one of those. And the Lord comes again and says, I've got something for you. He gives him the same word. I want you to go to Nineveh. And maybe you're sitting there this morning and the Lord came and he gave you a word a year ago or six months ago. Can I encourage you? Do what the Lord has asked you to do. Well, Jonah goes and an amazing thing happens. Nineveh repents. The people hear his cry, hear his message, and they repent, led by the king himself. And so hundreds of thousands of Ninevites Give their heart to the Lord. And so as we get to chapter 4, it's, it's an interesting chapter. You know, when our ways, when our plans don't live up or, or don't match up with the Lord's ways, it can be frustrating. It can, it can cause anger in us. It can cause us to, to question God. And, 
And you know, that's happening a lot today, right now with this coronavirus. There's a lot of people starting to question God. There's a lot of people starting to get impatient. There's a lot of people starting to get frustrated. And today is to remind us that God is in control. He's always been in control. He's the one that we want in control. So let's bow our heads, let's pray, and let's take a look at Jonah chapter 4. Father, we thank you for bringing us together. We love you. We thank you. And this is a, a simple thought for me always, but it, it always hits my heart, Lord. Uh, your ways are not my ways, and uh, what a blessing that is. My ways are destructive. My ways are of no use, really, to anybody. Your ways are perfect. Your ways are complete. Your ways have my heart and everybody's heart around me, uh, the, the best interests in mind. You love us. You care about us, Lord. Your perfect plan is that we would know you as Lord and Savior. You've initiated the plan. The only reason we can love you is because you first loved us. So this morning, Lord, fill us with hope. Fill us with joy. Fill us with peace, Lord. Ignite our hearts. Fill us with your spirit. And if there's anyone questioning what is happening, anyone uh, wondering why, that we'd be reminded today, we may not even have the answer, but we would know that you are in control. Bringing the lost to salvation waking up the church around the world. And for that, we're thankful, Jesus. So, Lord, do a mighty work in our hearts this morning. Do a mighty work in each and every one of us. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, Jonah chapter 4. And, uh, you know, it's uh, this question, what is the sovereignty of God? And it simply is that, that God is in control. God is the one who is orchestrating the plan. God is the one leading each day in what is happening. God does what he wants, how he wants to do it, and when he wants to do it. And that's not a statement to say that he's, uh, you know, he's some dictator. We know that that's not true. He's a God of love, and he cares very much for us. Well, Jonah chapter 4, and I think probably Jonah chapter 1, gives us a picture that Jonah struggles with the sovereignty of God. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go help those people out. And then after he does go to Nineveh, he's a little bit frustrated. At the end of Jonah chapter 3, guys, there is revival happening. Hundreds of thousands of Ninevites have turned to God. They have repented. They've turned from their wicked ways, and they've turned to God. Now, if you and I were writing a story or a movie or a book or whatever, we probably would have ended it at, at verse 10 of Jonah chapter 3. And here's what it says. When God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. That's how, that'd be a great and a happy ending right there. But we have chapter 4. And uh, it's interesting. We've got, we've got this, this wicked people, the Ninevites. We've got a compassionate, long-suffering, merciful God entering in. And, and we've got this prophet, Jonah. And, and if any of you have known me or talked with me about Jonah before, you know that I, I personally view Jonah as this crotchety old guy. He's just this bah humbug type guy. And here's what he does. He does go, after he gets vomited back up on the shore, he goes and he delivers God's message to Nineveh. They repent. God holds off his judgment. And everyone at the end of chapter 3, it appears, lives happily, happily ever after. But verse 1 of Jonah chapter 4, it says, It greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And, and our English words don't even come close to conveying what is actually being said here in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it would go uh, something like this. It was evil to Jonah. It was a great wickedness, and he was burning up inside. He was so displeased that the Ninevites had repented, 
and that God was showing them grace. The repentance of them and God's mercy for, in Jonah's eyes and Jonah's heart was a great injustice. And then Jonah, uh, uh, he walks away. He's angry. And in verse 2, it says, He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. I knew if they repented. <laughs> Here's what Jonah's conversing with God. I knew if they repented, you would forgive them. Jonah knew God's heart. He, he knew. He knew that if he went there, that this was what was going to happen. And he's saying, you know what? I, I knew you would, I, I knew that you would forgive them. And quite frankly, I don't want them to be forgiven. Jonah does not like them at all. I wanted to see them be judged. That's not what it says, but that's kind of his heart there. And here's what's happening. And this often happens in our life. God is drawing outside the lines of how Jonah wanted God to act. And maybe that is what is happening today, right now, as we go through this quarantine and this coronavirus. Two months ago, God was operating, maybe for many of us, if not all of us, just how we would like him to operate. We, we had all our ducks in a row. Life was sailing along. Our calendar was filled up. Things were in place. This was going well. This was going well. And, and poof, things changed radically. I would say in the last six weeks, the way that we viewed lines for March and April haven't gone how we thought they would go. God is not staying in the parameters that we set up. He's going way outside of them. It's way beyond our comprehension and way beyond our planning to have foreseen that in March and April of 2020, we would see the entire world brought to a standstill. God's working way outside our lines and our parameters. And he's doing that here in Jonah as well. God's grace and his mercy and his loving kindness, all of that is perfectly fine. All of that is within Jonah's parameters. God, if you work right inside here, if you're gracious toward Israel, if you're merciful towards Israel, if you're showing your loving kindness towards Israel, you're working right inside the box that I have made for you, God. But, but when you come out of that, it troubles me. When God was working, when he was in the belly of the fish, when he was hearing his prayer, when he was <laughs> giving ear to what he needed and had him vomited up on shore, Jonah was perfectly okay with that, with his prayer being heard for him and him being saved for him. <laughs> but it wasn't so fine when it applied to Gentiles, when it applied to the Ninevites, when it applied to somebody that for Jonah wasn't easy to love. And boy, I don't know what's happening, but I, I, I think I may have mentioned this every week. I think the Lord is waking the church up, guys. He's waking us up individually and corporately to remind us there's a world out there. There's sections and areas of all of our communities that are unreached. We do not need to travel to the jungles of Brazil. We do not need to travel to the remotest parts of India to reach unreached people groups. There are unreached people groups right here in our own hometown, in the United States of America. And I think sometimes we struggle reaching out to them because we, it's not comfortable. It's outside the lines of what we want to do as Christians. 
We want to say we're Christians. We want to live a Christian life, but within the lines that we've drawn. We want to plan our missions trips and when and who and how we minister. And sometimes God comes along and says, hey, I want you to go minister. He's been, no, no, no. Lord, I do not want to go there. I want to go here. Lord, please send me to Fiji. I'm ready to go. Listen, if I ever get to go to Fiji, it's going to have to be an audible call from the Lord saying, Ronnie, you're going to Fiji. <laughs> but you know what? In Fiji, some people being called there, that would be totally uncomfortable to them. It would be just like, I don't know. For Jonah, guys, God was working way outside his lines, asking him to go to a group of people that he despised. And here's what Jonah was mad at. These attributes of God, grace, mercy, and loving kindness, wasn't working in a way that Jonah wanted it to. God wasn't doing what Jonah thought he should do. And God's going to give Jonah a little object lesson in this. He is in control. God is sovereign. And so verse 4, after Jonah prays to the Lord in verse 2 and 3, the Lord says this. Do you have a good reason to be angry? Wow. What a powerful and simple verse. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Some of you might be watching this. You're dealing with anger. Might be anger that's been in, inside for years. Maybe from your childhood, from past relationship, a work experience. I, I don't know what it might be. A, a wounding. I, I don't know. But maybe you're struggling with anger. And maybe this right here, this question is why you tuned in today. Do you have a good reason to be angry? And let's see how the Lord deals with Jonah because he might be dealing with your heart in this very, very same way. <laughs> Jonah doesn't even answer. <laughs> Do you have a good reason to be angry? You know when you're angry and somebody says, why are you angry? You don't want to really talk about it. Here's what happens. Do you have good reason to be angry? Verse 5, Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. <laughs> I just see this crotchety old guy and God coming in and said, I love this guy. Do you have good reason to be angry? And I just picture Jonah going, ah, bah, and just walking out of the city and he goes east of it and it says he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. Now remember, the message God gave him, 40 days and Nineveh is going to be wiped out, going to be destroyed. Now, if all of this repentance took place in 10, 15, 20 days, then there was still time possibly but, you know, Jonah goes up on this hill to see what's going to happen. And perhaps he's thinking, you know what? Maybe they're going to blow it. Maybe they're going to return to their sin and wickedness. I need to sit and watch what's going to happen. I'm going to take a ringside seat. And, and this very well could be what Jonah was doing. And you wonder this too, you know, here's the people of Nineveh. Here comes this man with a word from God cries out and delivers the message. All of them hear the message. The spirit is moving clearly. Everybody repents. Everybody gives their life to the Lord. And the guy who delivered the message is angry. He's not rejoicing with them. He's not excited with them. He's not hugging them, discipling them, teaching them more about God. He's sitting on a hill, bitter with his arms folded under some cheap shelter. And I wonder if, if there was anybody in the village kind of looking out. I, I picture some, you know, little girl, eight, nine, ten, going, Mommy, what's, what's that man, the man who gave the message doing up on the hill? He looks so angry. <laughs> you, know, you can just see, I mean, why is he so mad at us? And you know what? I wonder if that's not what God might be doing also. It's just pointing out to the church, like, you know, guys, um, there's people that see in you not me, not the love of God, but they see anger. I wonder if the world's been looking at the church saying, why is the church so angry? 
a lot of Christians have come across like that in the world, that's for sure. And we know that our, what our stance should be like. We need to be Christ-like. That's what he's called us to be. We need to, here's one of those Christianese, Christianese statements. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. It sounds simple. Um, it, it sounds like one, of, but it's true. Guys, as Christians, we, we should hate all sin. We should hate sin. It should grieve us. It should, it should do something in our heart. When it's in our own personal life, it should grieve us. We should repent. We should mourn over it. We should turn from it. We should never glorify it. We should never uh, uh, accept it. We should never put, brush it under the carpet. We need to repent and turn from it when it's in our brothers and sisters or anybody. It's the very thing that separates us from the Lord. And we need to hate it. But we shouldn't hate the person. Listen, as a sinner, before Christ and in Christ, I have felt so much love from so many people. And some of that love has been tough. There, there have been people that have called out my sin, and I'm so thankful for that. But I've felt loved in it. That's what we need to be as a church. We need to love those who are living in sin. That doesn't mean we condone their behavior and we come along and give them a watered-down version of the gospel. That's not the case at all. We don't come alongside and enable them with thoughts of, I might push them away. If they're in sin, they're already away. We need to come alongside and say, there's a God that wants to build the bridge back that you've severed by your life decisions. And so here's Jonah. He's up on a hill. And he's bitter. We need to ask the Lord to give us eyes to see people as he sees them, as sheep without a shepherd people in need of direction, people in need of forgiveness. That we'd have a heart like the Lord's that's merciful and gracious. Jonah's angry and his focus is in the wrong place. Now, here's where he should have been. He should have been in the city encouraging these people, teaching them, loving on them. But where is he? He's on a hillside. I don't know, you know, God has already shown Jonah great grace. The fish that he appointed him uh, to swallow him. Uh, you know, there's some fish out there that have some big teeth. <laughs> it's very clear that the fish that the Lord appointed to swallow Jonah was one that could swallow him down nice and gently and vomit him back up nice and gently. <laughs> God had shown him grace, that's for sure. Well, here's Jonah sitting on a hill in verse 6. It says, The Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. Again, let's read that verse. The Lord God appointed a plant. Here's the second thing God has appointed for Jonah. The first thing was a fish. A little, more, a little bit more tough love there to get Jonah's attention and to get him back on track but still gracious and merciful. Here's another thing the Lord appoints, a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. <laughs> he looks at Jonah up there, really just pouting. And God says, I'm going to bless him. I'm going to bring him some shade and protect him from the sun. And I think it's amazing. And here's the only time we see Jonah happy in the book. And we all see it. We all know why he's happy. <laughs> because his personal comfort is being met. God is now back inside the lines that Jonah is accustomed to. God is working in an area that Jonah, he's focused on him. Ah, I'm so happy. I have shade. I have comfort. Thank you. Thank you, God. But here's the good thing. God is going to use this to teach him a lesson. He's going to teach him a lesson that God is in control, that he is, in, that he is sovereign. Verse 7, God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. 
and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. <laughs> oh, this guy. I'll tell you, I'm going to be the last one to throw a stone at Jonah. I mean, I know some of you are sitting there and being really honest with your hearts. Like, man, I've been this guy right here. Letting God know that I have perfectly good reason to be angry. <laughs> and God is teaching him a lesson. Here's a question for us. We've seen it twice. Has the Lord ever asked you this? Do you have a right to be angry? Guys, what's going on around the world uh, is life-changing for many. And again, I, I don't know what camp you're in. Maybe you're in this camp where you think this is way overblown and out of control in that regard, or you're way on this side. It's like we're not even doing enough to stop this, or you're somewhere in the middle. Wherever you are in that camp, you know what, you're entitled to that. But here's what I hope all of us can do, whether we're over here or over here, we're all somewhere in the middle, is that we can realize and remember God is in control. He's in control. And do you have a right to be angry? And it may go way beyond this. Maybe you're not even concerned about this. Maybe you've got other issues going on. Do you have a right to be angry at your wife? Do you have a right to be angry at your husband? Do you have a right to be angry at your kids? Do you have a right to be angry at your neighbors or your coworkers? Do you have a right to be angry at your church, your church family? Do you have a right to be angry? For Jonah, things weren't going the way he wanted. And we can be just like Jonah. When things don't go our way, we point our anger at God. We're disappointed. We look to him and say, why? Why isn't this happening? And here's what's beautiful. In the midst of Jonah going through this, God in his grace doesn't blast Jonah. He continues to love him. And verse 10 and 11, it says, The Lord said, You had compassion on the plant, for which you did not work, and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals? God says, You're grieving over a plant. But what about these 120,000? And these 120,000 is talking about the children of Nineveh. God takes Jonah's heart somewhere else. He goes, all right, so you're upset with the, the adults, but what about the kids? What about the kids? I know you're upset at the adults in their angry ways or, or, or their evil ways, but what about the children? God is asking Jonah, where's your compassion? Where's your mercy? Where's your grace? And here's the thing that we learn as we had to close here. The plant that God sent for, for Jonah was temporary. Just temporary relief from the sun. And God's pointing out, like, that's just a temporary thing. The plant has very little value in the big scheme of things, Jonah. But people are highly valued. Are highly valued by the one that called you, Jonah are highly valued by me, your God, are highly valued by me. Jonah cared for himself and for a plant. God cared for the spiritual destiny of hundreds of thousands of people, and he still cares very much about that today. We've been so concerned about our toilet paper, our vacations, our hair, our 401ks, our well-being, and so many other things. And maybe in this season, God's coming and he's saying, but, 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 Ronnie, don't you care about people? What about the most important thing? People's hearts 
and where they'll spend eternity. For Jonah, he was letting them know, listen, your box, you had me in this, I care about Israel. Yes, I do. But I also care about the Ninevites. I care about everyone, Jonah. You see, God is not just the creator of the Israelites or the Americans or on down the line. He's the creator of all. He cares about everyone. Jonah thought that the things that were important to him should be important to God, and that is true. There are many things that are important to us that are very, very important to God, but there's also a lot of things that are important to us that God is reminding us maybe aren't so important. And reminding us, you know what, Ron, you had your eyes fixed on that, and I hope you've realized that that's really not that important. And I think what God is also showing us today is he's reminding us and wants us to see things from his perspective. He's a lover of people. He's a lover of all people, all races, all colors, all around the globe. And he wants us to have eyes and ears and a heart for this world. We can love those people that it's easy to love, that fits inside of our box. But what if God asked you to go outside that box to share his love? which he does all throughout scripture with men and women and all throughout church history, would we go? Guys, God's priority is people. And he was trying to get Jonah's attention that, and God is sovereign. God is sovereign. I want to close with, by reading a, a few verses from Isaiah 55. Uh, if you'll turn there, Isaiah 55, verse 6 through 11. It says, verse 6, Isaiah 55, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. I don't know how to ask this, but who are we to question God? <laughs> who chooses to show love and grace and mercy to whomever he wishes, and that whomever is the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whomsoever would believe in him would not perish. Jonah, if those Ninevites want to repent and believe in me, they're not going to perish. You go and give the word. What I do with them is entirely up to me. Ronnie and whoever you are out there, you go and share the word. Not just with those that you love, but with those that you don't know, those of different cultures, those that might even be your enemies. Go and share the word because their eternity matters. His word does not return void. And this is a good reminder. We've heard many times, his ways are higher and his thoughts are higher and way beyond us. God's word is going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Did Jonah get it? Well, we're not really sure. We're not really sure. Here's what we know. God has the last word in the book of Jonah. God has the very last word. The book kind of ends abruptly. With God just saying, you know, shouldn't I have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals, which maybe we can just deduct from that, that Jonah got it. That God had the last word and Jonah's like, huh, you're right. If Jonah's the author, that was just it. That was the end. 
Whoever Jonah told the story to, it, it might offer it. And I personally think Jonah is the author of Jonah. And, you know, the focus of the book of Jonah is not Jonah. It's God. It's sovereignty. The main character is God. And Jonah was just this guy kind of all crotchety walking through it. And God was inviting him. Hey, I want you to be a part of my plan. Come on. And when God had the final word, that was it. Let's give God the first and the final and every word in between in our hearts. Let's remember that God is sovereign. We may not have all the answers, but I pray that our hearts can rest and trust in this, that he's in control. And whatever he's doing through this season is not a punishment for us, but it's to awaken us. Maybe it is to cause our hearts to turn and repent. Maybe it's to stir up the gifts that are within us. Maybe it's to remind us of a promise or a word that he gave us. And he's coming back and he's giving us a word a second or a third time and saying, go, go, because I'm after people. Guys, there's so many out there, like the Ninevites, who were like us, lost apart from Christ who need Jesus. And we're it. God is calling us out. So let's do this. Let's remove our box and our lines. And let's let God work however he wishes in and through our lives. Amen? Hey, as we close, I do need to say this. I miss all of you. I look forward to when we can get together again. In person, to come together and hug, to worship, to pray, to read his word together. But until then, let's continue to seek after him in our homes, in our fields, and wherever he's taking you throughout the day. The new people he's introducing us to and the old relationships that he's rekindling through this. And let's give all glory to him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. And simply, Father, show us those things that maybe we deem important that are not. What is the plant in our life that is bringing us so much happiness that really is insignificant? It's bringing us great comfort. It's bringing us great joy. But it's so self-serving. And you're trying to get our attention and saying, you care about a plant? I want your focus to be on the hearts of men and women who need me. Lord, stir up our hearts and give us eyes to see and ears to hear. I do pray that you would continue to protect us for those who are struggling uh, through this, either physically, financially, mentally, whatever is going on, Lord, whatever the world is thrown at, any of our brothers and sisters out there, Lord, bring a peace upon their heart right now. Remind each and every one of us by your spirit that you're in control and that you have us. We love you, Lord. We commit today to you. And we pray that you would just fill us with the joy of our salvation. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys, have a great day. Have a great Sunday. Have a great final week of April. And we look forward to seeing you in May. God bless.